getting here. Uh, my name is Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture extension agent here in Leon County. And we have a guest speaker today, Julie McConnell, who's the horticulture extension agent in Bay County, where uh, that's Panama City. And she's an entomologist and she's got a very cool topic. She's gonna talk to us about predatory insects. Uh, so some of the rules again, if you all will keep yourselves muted, um, turn off your video, uh, just to save some bandwidth and avoid uh, distracting some of the rest of us. Um, that would be great. And if you have questions for Julie as she's going through her presentation, uh, please put that in the chat box and I will be keeping up with them and we'll ask her at the end of her presentation to answer those questions. And then we do go to 12 o'clock. So Julie's got about an hour's worth of presentation here. Uh, we'll go through her questions if we still have time. We'll open the floor to just general gardening questions. Uh, Denmark, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to answer your, some of your questions. If you have any, uh, you might have to get with your local, uh, you know, agriculture. I don't know if they got extension in Denmark, but uh, we'll find, we'll try to find something for you over there. Um, all right, Julie, I think uh, the floor is yours. Okay. So uh, my name is Julie McConnell and I am the horticulture agent in Bay County, Florida. That's in Panama City, up in the Panhandle. And um, just wanted to kind of introduce myself. Oh, let me get my thing working here, hold on. Okay. So I have a Bachelor of Science in Ornamental Horticulture Production from Auburn University and a Master of Science in Entomology and Nematology from the University of Florida. I also have a graduate certificate in landscape pest management from the University of Florida. And before I came to work in Extension, I spent 10 years working in the wholesale nursery industry in the Atlanta market. So I have to admit that if you had told me 20 years ago that I would have a degree in entomology and that I would um, actually enjoy the topic, I would have thought you were crazy. Uh, when I was an undergrad at Auburn, I took one entomology class and I got a D. As we used to say, D is for diploma, which means it's just good enough to pass. It was the worst grade I got on any of my category specific classes. I usually had A's and B's, so not something I was proud of. But part of the problem was that I really fell into these, um, these entomology stereotypes, or these were kind of the perceptions that I had growing up. You know, I always heard, you know, bugs were, were gross and you know, you only had bugs in filthy conditions. They sting, they bite, they suck your blood, they transmit disease and parasites, they eat your plants, and they're just creepy and crawly in general. And, you know, that was kind of what I was exposed to growing up. I had no appreciation for insects. I mean, yes, I thought butterflies were pretty, but I still didn't want to touch them. Um, and coming into this position, I really had a lot of questions about entomology, and I was not prepared at all. Um, as you can tell, my background in entomology was very limited and I didn't thrive in that environment and even working in nursery sales. Yes, I could recognize there may have been pest insects on the plants on the nursery, but we had a crew that took care of that. So all I did was say that greenhouse over there, there's a white fly and somebody else took care of it. I didn't know what happened after that, to be honest with you. So as I got further into the degree program, obviously I learned a lot and my perspective ha has changed. And granted, some of my uh, initial uh, stereotypical attitudes were not necessarily incorrect, but if you look at them uh, from a different viewpoint, you can actually appreciate um, the huge, huge role that insects play in our environment. So are they filth feeders? Yeah, some of them are. They help to break down organic material, whether that's vegetative or it's animals. Um, that decomposition, you know, they'll take big pieces, break it down, excrete it out, and then that is what some other microorganisms or smaller insects or other creatures, you know, continue that process. That's what adds organic matter to our soil and makes it where we can grow plants. It also just eliminates waste. Um, if you've ever um, been out to a cow pasture and seen all the piles of manure. If it weren't for dung beetles, there'd be a whole lot more manure out there. It would be a mess. Um, stings and bites. Yep, a lot of insects do sting and bite and they're usually defending their nest or their food source. They're not trying to eat you. 
they are just trying to protect their young. They want to reproduce and recreate just like humans do. Blood feeders, again, it's part of the reproductive cycle. There are some insects where the female must have a blood meal in order to um, create viable eggs. And it's not just on humans, it's not just on, on you know, our domesticated animals and our, our pets. There are insects that feed off of reptiles and amphibians and, and all kinds of insects. Transmitting disease and parasites, well, that is a little bit hard for us to wrap our brain around because we want to be healthy. But again, you've got a pathogen that's taking advantage of the insect. They're using that insect as a mode of transmission. And again, just so it can replicate and um, not disappear from the face of the planet. Insects eat our desirable plants. I don't like it when I'm growing tomatoes and a stink bug feeds on it and causes a rotten spot. I don't like when my pretty shrubs are eaten by insects. But if you stop and think about it, if you did not have that insect pressure keeping those plants in check, they would just overgrow the planet. If anyone has dealt with some of the invasive plant species that we have um, in Florida and anywhere over the world, I'm sure, you realize that they can really get out of hand and usually it's a combination of things. One is that obviously the climate and the conditions are positive for the for growth of that plant. But a big problem is that when it's in an area that it didn't originate, where it's not you know, living its normal cycle, it doesn't have natural enemies or that something that kind of keeps that growth in check. So here in the panhandle of Florida, we have a, a really severe problem with air potato vine. And that plant will just grow over trees and just basically smother them out or, or take away their light source so they can't thrive. And they were able to do that because nothing ate them. So through biological control program, they introduced the air potato leaf beetle, which is found in, in the native region of that vine. And they've been um, released in, and established in many parts of Florida and helped to get that vine under control. So, you know, if you kind of think about it from, from that standpoint, you know, it's okay for our plants to be eaten. They're supposed to be eaten, not just by us, also by other animals. And then creepy and crawly, yeah, they kind of are, but they're also really fascinating. I don't like cockroaches. I, I do have to say I'm a little biased against them, but it's really interesting to see the cracks and crevices and where they can fit into and, um, you know, that yes, they can live without their head for a given amount of time. So, you know, there's a lot of things that insects do that if we just kind of stop and watch, they, we could really appreciate how, how interesting they are. So, again, beneficial insects in the garden. I think um, pollination is what most people think about. They think about our food source. They think about, you know, honeybees and native bees and, and other pollinators, and that gets um, a lot of credit. And it's really important. I'm not saying that it's not. But one thing that I think a lot of people overlook is that insects in the garden can really help to play a huge role in our, our pest management. So, you know, even though I said it's good for the insects to eat the plants and, you know, do these other things, you know, there still needs to be a balance. And so I, I would really hope that you leave this, um, this webinar uh, feeling like I'm going to just stop, watch and see what's going on with the insects in my garden and um, maybe let them play a role and it will save you time and money and it's also kind of interesting to look at. So I'm going to talk about predators and parasitoids and I decided to um, kind of group the, the, the talk into behavior because what I'd really like for people to do is I would like you to take the time to observe insects when you come across them you know, obviously I don't want you to just automatically think that they're bad and try to kill them, but I really want you to take some time to observe their behavior, see what they're doing. And this will really help you identify what their role is. You don't have to know exactly what the insect is. There's at least a million worldwide, so we're never gonna know all of them. But if you can kind of take the time to see what is it doing, is it being helpful, is it being neutral, or is it doing something that I really just can't tolerate, and then make any other decisions from there. So we're gonna start with our ambush or trap predators and move into a few hunting predators and then we're gonna talk about parasitoids. 
So some of our, our insects that use an ambush technique um, or they, they form a trap are the naiads, which is the juvenile form of dragonflies and damselflies. Also antlions, which a lot of people um, recognize as being called goodlebugs. And of course, praying mantids. We have to talk about mantids. They're so fascinating. So your dragonfly and damselflies, a lot of people don't realize that their juvenile form is, is aquatic. And you can find them in truly aquatic um, settings or in areas that really kind of stay moist or damp, almost swampy type conditions. And this is their part of their larval life cycle. They molt up to 15 times, sometimes even more throughout that time period. It takes a very long time for them to um, reach the stage that they're going to emerge and, and grow their beautiful wings. But what they do for their um, hunting strategy is that they stay along like the bottom of wherever it is, whether it's a pond or a marshy area, and they just kind of wait quietly. And then as some prey comes by, they will project their jaw out and grasp the, the prey, and then they're able to eat it. So they, some of their um, things that they eat are mosquito larvae, uh, aquatic invertebrates, tadpoles, even small fish. So um, and this photo shows the um, larval casings on a log. So once they reach the size that they're ready to emerge as an adult, then they're going to actually, of course, come out of the water into a dry area because once that adult emerges, of course, it's going to have to unfurl its wings and dry and, and, and be able to fly. So, and then the, the adults, of course, are hunters that, that hunt on the fly. And we'll, we'll talk about them briefly. So another one that uses this ambush or trap technique are your antlions or doodlebugs. And the um, photo that looks just kind of like dirt, I don't know if you can see, but there are like funnel shaped little holes in the ground. And what you'll see, sometimes you'll see this, there'll be like kind of a mass of them. And inside that hole is this little creature that looks like some prehistoric animal. Um, which is the larvae of the antlion, and it is down there in the hole. And what happens is that unsuspecting ant or another insect walks across the top of that little pit or trap, whatever you want to call it, and the sand is very loose. And so it falls down in there and then it, it's attacked. If by chance it starts to get away and tries to climb out, the antlion will throw sand towards it so that it may, kind of dislodges the sand that it's trying to walk on. So that it makes it unstable and it falls back in. So they're really, really good um, at, at being able to, uh, once the prey falls down in there, it doesn't normally get out. Uh, sometimes you'll see not just these little holes in the ground, but you may also see some like little um, carcasses laying around because the antlion will kind of pitch what it doesn't eat outside of the, the hole. So it's Interesting. So praying mantids. Uh, mantids come in a lot of different colors and shapes and sizes, and they're able to camouflage themselves very, very well. I know in Florida we have one, I didn't find a good photo that I could share, but the uh, grizzled man mantid has like really looks like almost lichen and moss and they tend to hang out like on tree trunks facing down so as insects crawl up they can grab them. But the, the mantids are really cool because they can turn their head 180 degrees and you know this helps them look for prey but they also head turned backwards they can grab something um, or bite something. They typically use their, their forelegs and their forelegs are described as raptorial so kind of like a raptor. And this is what gives them the common name of praying mantids um, or praying mantis is, is some of the, or some of the species. Because while they sit in wait, their hands are kind of in a, a hands, their forelegs are in a praying hands kind of um, position. And then if something comes by, they can strike out really, really quickly, um, five one hundredth of a second. And depending on the size of the mantid, that reach could be up to four inches away from its body. They have spines on those forelegs, which I hope you can see in the photo, and that helps to impale the, um, the target. And then they can, of course, bring it to them and, 
and and eat it. Um, they have been known even to have like one insect impaled on one leg and still grab something else. So they're not picky about what they eat. They will eat all kinds of other insects, including other mantids. So I know what you all are going to ask. So I'm just going to go ahead and head this off. Do they really practice sexual cannibalism? Do, do the females eat the males? Well, sometimes they do, but not all. It's not as common as most people think. I think a lot of people assume that every single female mantid eats her mate, um, but there's really only specific species that do that. Not even all of them do it at all. And then even among the ones that um, are known for, for doing this, it's only roughly about 25% of the time. So it's not guaranteed. Um, male mantids are able to uh, mate with multiple females if, um, if they don't get eaten. So why do they do this? Well, as you can imagine, the egg, kind of the egg sac, the otheca that a female mantid produces has a lot of eggs in it, 100 to 200 eggs and it's composed of a lot of material and then it's, you know, it's attached to um, usually vegetative material. That takes a lot of energy, a lot of resources, and she's a big insect. So even um, just providing enough nutrient and energy for herself is, is, a, is, it just requires a lot. And then to create these viable eggs and to create a lot of viable eggs, um, is just really takes takes a lot of input. So sometimes that male is the input. Um, if she does uh, turn her head and what, what, what happens usually is that during um, copulation, she'll turn her head around, bite the male's head off. Well, he can still con continue to mate. So she still is gonna be able to reproduce. And then um, when she's finished, then she can finish consuming him. So here, uh, I wanted to show you a picture of this grass-like mantid, because this is one that we, we do find in Florida, and it looks a lot like a stick insect and can easily be mistaken. But if you notice that it has those raptorial forelegs, and so that is something that is um, obviously very distinctive to the mantids, um, also the, the head shape and how it can turn its head around. On the right-hand side is an example of an Ootheca, and so this contains a lot of um, a lot of eggs. And people are finding those right now. I, you know, kind of follow a lot of different um, entomology, social media sites, and, and they're finding them all over the place. Um, I know Mary Selena has told me about, um, she's the Santa Rosa or residential horticulture agent. I think she did a program for y'all recently. And somebody had brought her one and they thought that it was just an old case and uh, she had it in her office and then she came in one morning and there were just hundreds of baby mantids all over her office and they're trying to, to capture them. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know if she ever got them all, but um, that's something to think about. If you bring it indoors, if the temperature is right, it could hatch. So um, be prepared for that if you go gathering. But usually just leave them in the garden and they'll hatch out. Hopefully they'll do a good job of pest control. You know, they'll They'll eat each other to some degree if there's nothing else available. Okay, so we're gonna move on to kind of more traditional hunting predators. And these are usually a little bit easier to, to th this is where it's important to be really watching for their behavior. And these are some that I'm saying direct consumption as opposed to we're gonna talk about parasitoids in just a little bit. And so the way I wanted to kind of explain this is that you know the insect that you see is the one that's gonna actually eat what it catches. Um, beetles, there are so many different kinds of beetles and I'm going to just talk briefly about a couple of different ones that are that I think you may see. Uh, we'll touch on dragonflies and damselflies, the adult, and then also lacewing. So ground beetles, there are over 2,000 species in North America and both the larvae and the adults are predators, usually found like in um, soil, soil as the name applies, ground beetles. Um, or traveling throughout plants. And this photo is of a ground beetle larvae. 
a lot of people are kind of familiar with the beetle larvae that look like grubs that we tend to see like in, um, you know, feeding on our, our turf grass and stuff. And those look a lot like maggots, really the fly larvae. Um, but there are so many, so many uh, beetle larvae that look kind of more like this, where you can really see that they have those powerful mandibles where they can consume prey. Um, they have, you know, legs that are kind of, you know, longish and skinny that you um, can tell that they can move quickly, they can chase things down. This, these are examples of just a couple of brown beetles. There are so many, there's no way I could show them all to you. Um, tiger beetles fall into that category. A lot of times they have kind of long legs, they move really, really quickly, they can be very difficult to catch, lots of different colors, a lot of them are metallic, a lot of um, collectors will have just ridiculous number of uh, ground beetles just because they're so pretty. They're just really, really beautiful. Um, and they're, they're very good predators in, in the garden. So when you see these, you know, please don't put a boot, boot heel to them. Ladybird beetles. So you notice I'm not calling them ladybugs because bugs um, are actually insects that are found in the order Hemiptera. And these are in the order Coleoptera because they are actually beetles. So I have to tell you, it is sometimes I slip up and I say ladybug, but I have tried, tried, tried since I started training as an entomologist to transition to lady beetles, ladybird beetles, um, and really kind of make people aware that that's what they are. They are actually beetles. So both the larvae and the adults will hunt, and we most commonly find them feeding on soft-bodied insects, such as mealybugs, aphids, and soft scale. The adults are really easy to recognize. Now there are different color schemes, there are different kind of spots, different kind of, you know, yellow, red, orange, um, different colors. And granted, I know that the one on the right hand side is not one of our native species. I'm not sure about the one on the left. Um, but either way, they are established. And even though they may not be um, originally from here, they do play a role in helping with pest management in the garden. If you um, notice on the right hand side, um, that lady beetle is um, right in the thick of things with some aphids and it was, it was having a field day. It had plenty to eat there. But a lot of people, even though they can recognize the adults and the adults are feeding also, they tend to not realize that the larvae look quite different. Um, you know, you may notice, yes, it's got some black and some orange on it, but it really doesn't look like that sweet little, I'm shaped like a Volkswagen Beetle, brightly colored spotted critter that we're used to seeing. Um, instead, they're kind of elongated, they look almost spiny, um, and again, if you looked closely, you could see they have the big jaws, and, and they're kind of intimidating looking. But if you, um, if you watch them, you'll see them scurrying around and running around. And, and I always tend to find them on plants that have aphids. Um, and they, they really, really consume a lot. And if you, if you think about it, you know, yes, the adults need to eat, but the larvae of insects are kind of like raising teenagers. They are going through, they're using so much energy to get to the next stage, you know, to molt to the next size um, and, and just keep on you know, going through those life stages and then for beetles that have a pupation period, you know, they've got to go into that stage too. Um, they eat a lot and it's really important to make sure that we're not doing anything that's going to target them because um, they, they really, you know, they, they eat a lot of our pests. Uh, so here, and I apologize that these pictures are not really very clear but I wanted to enlarge them so that you could see them um, as much as possible. But this is what the pupa looks like for the ladybird beetle. And um, if you kind of caught it at a glance, it, it kind of looks like a little blob of snot. I don't, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, on the left hand side, this is one that is attached to a piece of mealy grass right among an infestation of mealybugs. And mealybugs are one of their, uh, one of their target prey um, that I find them feeding on. On the right hand side, um, I just found this this weekend on a crepe myrtle and the crepe myrtle is just covered in city molten because it's been eaten up with some type of honeydew producing insects. And what I've noticed is 
um, they may start out just looking tan and over time, just before it emerges, the spots start to develop that you can see through that pupil case and then it will emerge. Um, I brought one in one time that I found, actually it may have been the one on the muley grass here on the left, but I brought it into my office and I set up time lapse um, on my iPad and I left it for just uh, about 24 hours because I'd been, I'd been watching it. I'd been noticing that the color was transitioning. And when I did time lapse, it was really funny. If you see the one on the right, you, you may notice that there's like little white things coming out and that's just where it's attached to the leaf. And so as it was, you know, we think about you know, chrysalis and, and pupas and, and cocoon and stuff that nothing's going on inside, but there's so much that's going on inside. And uh, when I, I reviewed the time lapse later on, I realized it moved a lot. Like it was attached to the plant material, but it would raise up and go down. And of course, with time lapse, it's a little, you, know, you can't really tell what the, how quickly it moves, not as fast as the, the footage shows. But I was really, I found it really, really um, interesting that there was so much movement um, before it actually emerged. So keep an eye out for these. I usually find them you know, I'll, if I go to a plant and I see that there, there's some feeding by some soft body insects, a lot of times I'll find um, all different life stages. I have a hard time finding eggs. They're not, they're not as easy to find, especially as my eyes age. But I usually can find larvae and pupa and adults um, of, all on the same plant. So try to preserve those so they can do, do their duty. Another type of beetle that a lot of people are not familiar with is the mealybug destroyer. And on the left hand side is an adult and it is eating a mealybug, which a mealybug is one of our sap feeding, honeydew producing pests of a lot of ornamental plants. Um, some years I feel like I find mealybugs on everything I own. And on the right hand side is the larvae of that beetle. And if you notice, it looks an awful lot like mealybugs. So, uh, you know, to me, that's, it's good and bad. If we're looking at our plants and we're seeing this and we are familiar with mealybugs, we might think, oh, this is a pest insect. And that's where I want you to stop and watch. Because the mealybugs, they move, but it's really slow. You know, when they feed, they pierce their mouth parts into the plant and they're sucking out the, the sugars of the plant. They don't really move rapidly. They usually only move when you're messing with them. So, and, and that's something I would do on a regular basis. But otherwise, they're fairly sedentary, not completely. But the mealybug destroyer that looks a lot like a mealybug, they're not sitting still. They are running around. You find them with aphids and other insects, and you will find them with mealybugs, but you have to watch their behavior and see this one is trucking around looking for something to eat. And when they get something, they are ferocious. I have seen them grab an aphid and just shake their head back and forth like a dog with a, a chew toy. Um, and it's very obvious they're not hurting the plant. Okay, so, so watch for that. They're very, very common. Um, and one thing that's really kind of neat is that they eat all life stages. They eat the eggs too. So they'll eat the eggs, they'll eat the larvae, they'll eat the adults of, of some of these pest insects. So they're really, really handy to have around. So I hope that you will look for those and see if you can recognize any. But again, you've got to watch their activity because otherwise they are really, really camouflaged with pest. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Of course, we mentioned earlier that their, um, their juvenile form is more of an ambush type predator and the adults, they're gonna fly. And they have these large compound eyes where they can see um, very well. They're very strong flyers. And what they tend to do is grasp the prey with their forelegs mid-flight. And then they use their strong mandibles to immobilize and then eat their prey. Um, this one here is, is a dragonfly eating. I'm not even sure what it's eating. I took the picture. I followed it around video. This is a thing I do. Okay? I'm, I'm out there constantly taking pictures of bugs or videotaping. My, my poor daughter, she looks at my phone and she's like, you have more pictures of bugs than me. It's true. Okay, so um, one big difference between the, or is if you're just kind of looking and, and I don't really try to identify um, 
dragonflies and damselflies because to really do it properly, you have to look at their wing venation and I'm just not patient enough. So I don't even bother. On the left hand side is a damselfly. And if you notice the eyes, although they're still really large, they're separated. And when they're at rest, they fold their wings back along their back. Dragonflies, most of them, the eyes are touching. There are some species of dragonfly where the, the eyes are separated. Um, and then in general, they usually have their wings spread out when they're resting um, on vegetation or on, on inanimate objects. So that's, that's one good way to kind of tell. Damselflies tend to be really delicate and usually kind of smaller, but there's all different size dragonflies too. Uh, we usually find both of these living or, or really active in areas where there is access to some swampy areas or water. And that is just because, as you would expect, because their um, their juvenile forms are aquatic, they need to be able to lay their eggs either on or near the water. So lacewing, these are really, really neat little insects. I know this is probably difficult to see, um, but what they do is the eggs are laid on stalks and this is to protect the eggs from predators. A lot of times you'll see like a circular pattern. Uh, on the left hand side, these um, lacewing eggs are on a milkweed plant and the milkweed plant is of course just completely infested with aphids, which is not a big deal. It's fine. Um, they're still found monarch caterpillars um, eventually on the plant. There was plenty for everybody. On the right hand side, it's probably difficult to see this on a window where there's a circular pattern of the eggs. I, I find them a lot of times on um, just strange objects, not necessarily on plant material. They'll, they'll be kind of anywhere. The larvae are also known as trash bugs, and I'm going to show you some pictures of them. They're not the greatest pictures, I apologize. Actually, the best picture, of course, is one from Lyle Bus with our Insect ID Lab, because he has fantastic photos. Um, and that is a picture of a brown lacewing that's about to attack an aphid. And then on the, in the middle, this is a magnified view of a lacewing. I'm not sure if it was brown or green or maybe a different one. I think it's a green, green lacewing. And it has, an, and you can see it's got like those little pincher type jaws and there's an aphid in there. But what also, and again, it's hard to distinguish, is it has stuff on its back. I don't know how else to put it. It has trash on its back. What a lot of times you'll see, these are very, very small, is you'll see some movement and it looks like lint from the dryer or just some other piece of garbage that you can't quite figure out. So you won't necessarily see this nice clear uh, view of the, the larvae like you see in Lyle's photo here, but instead you just see something moving around um, amid your, your pests and you, you're really just trying to figure out what it is. And there's a really good chance that it's a lace wing, I'm sorry, Yes, a lacewing larvae. Um, on the right hand side, next to the pine cone, between the pine cone and the gr grass blade, there is an adult green lacewing. And they're very, very hard to see. Their wings are very transparent. You can kind of see the body. Um, and, you know, these, they are also predators. Um, but they, they eat pollen and some other things too, not just insects. But these are really neat little little creatures that you really want to keep an eye out for, especially look for those distinctive eggs. You're probably more likely to see those than anything else. And just know, just leave them, they're good. So parasitoids. So a lot of people, there's parasites that we're all fairly familiar with. And then in the insect world, and, and I'm sure some other animals also, but I'm most familiar with insects, we have um, parasitoids. And Kind of the, the difference is the parasitoid is going to have at least one life stage that develops inside or on a host. And typically the host dies. Um, and then the insect just moves on to its next life stage. Sometimes they may spend more than one, but it's typically just one life stage. A lot of times it's the juvenile life stage, the, the larvae um, of of the parasitoid that is going to um, 
you know, use those resources. So the female will lay the eggs, and actually sometimes it's live larvae that they lay, depending on, on the insect, um, in, on, or near the host. And then, and those relationships tend to be pretty, pretty specific. There are a lot of different parasitoids and there are a lot of different hosts, but when you get down to it, usually you've got a species of parasitoid that is looking for a specific species of insects, um, if that makes sense. I think a lot of us are pretty familiar if you've been around, um, you know, extension or master gardeners, you've heard about the Lara wasp, which is what's in this photo here. And this is a wasp that will, um, it will sting a mole cricket to immobilize it and lay an egg on it. And then it, the mother goes, the wasp goes away. And what happens is the mole cricket, when it recovers from the sting, it goes down into its burrow. And then the egg hatches out and the larvae feeds on it and, you know, eventually the mole cricket dies. So this is something that was introduced as a means of biological control. So among the parasitoids, the most common ones that we run across are going to be in the order Hymenoptera, which is your bees, wasps, and ants. Uh, I mentioned the Lara wasp with the mole cricket. Um, another one is the Tamarixia, which is something that is um, biological control, teeny tiny little wasp that is being released to try to um, manage the Asian citrid, citrus psyllid, which is the insect that transmits citrus green to our citrus in Florida, uh, which is a, a major problem for the citrus industry. Um, and then cicada killer. So, that's kind of one of our bigger ones. Most of them are really teeny tiny little little wasps, but that's that's a big one and we have to talk about it because everybody's asking about murder hornets. Uh, the other order that we have a lot of parasitoids in are the diptera, which are your true flies. So your hover flies or surfeit flies um, and then your uh, tachinid flies also. So these are examples of uh, parasitoid wasps. There are thousands of species and um, the only reason that I know what is in the container on the left is because it was sent to me from the um, Department of Agriculture and that is the Tamarixia wasp which is that parasitoid of the um, Asian citrus psyllid that I mentioned before and I, I put this photo in here not because you could see what they look like but because I wanted you to see how tiny they are. They are incredibly small um, and you know one of the things that we, we typically see with these is that a lot of them are very, very small, many less than five millimeters long. These little things are probably two millimeters. They're really, really small. And their targets are, tend to be larger than them. So we'll see them attack caterpillars, psyllids, scale, leaf miner, aphids, um, all kinds of different insects. The photo on the right is a picture of a, an armyworm caterpillar and it has wasp larvae. I don't know what the specific um, species is. I just know that it's in the, um, oh, I love Latin. Uh, Eulof, oh, that's my best shot at it. Uh, family, oh, which I spelled wrong. I noticed that there. And I found this caterpillar in my vegetable garden. This, I think it was last spring. I don't know, it doesn't really matter. But I noticed that there was something on it. And I couldn't really see closely. This was a couple of days after I had it because of course I kept it because that's what people like me do. Um, and it, to me, they look like kind of gr light green pasta shells. Anyways, but they were feeding on the, um, on the caterpillar and they eventually pupated and then they emerged as like teeny tiny little wasps. I put them in my freezer hoping that one day they'd get under a microscope and I'd be able to identify them and it just really didn't happen. Um, and really the only reason that I knew for sure what family was because some entomologist on Twitter helped me out. So good resource for, for insect ID. But it was, it was really very fascinating to see, um, to see that, that, whole, that whole thing happen. Uh, another group are the tachinid flies, and again, several species that attack different hosts. Um, caterpillars are common prey, but they're certainly not limited to caterpillars. All kinds of different um, insects can be, can be hosts. And um, again, I was just collecting caterpillars outside, and initially I didn't even see these on the caterpillar. 
Um, but after it was kind of sitting in a little dish on my, um, in my office, which my office was, this was the spring. So I was on my back porch um, during shutdown. And all of a sudden I see little critters that were consuming the caterpillar. And these um, are fly larvae. So they are technically maggots and, you know, had a little different motion, different um, shape and everything than um, the little wasp larvae that were on the previous caterpillar. So the flies tend to uh, deposit their eggs or live larvae. Sometimes they actually um, deposit larvae rather than eggs on the host, the soil surface, nearby vegetation, it just depends um, on the species. And there are even some that lay their eggs in areas where the, the host has to actually eat them, ingest them, and, um, and then they're um, and they're parasitic. So. so the cicada killer wasp, also known as a giant ground hornet. I wanted to make sure that I mentioned this because uh, with the news that we had earlier this year about the murder hornet that was found in, was it Washington State? I can't remember. There was one place on the West Coast uh, where it was identified and people were really concerned. And of course, everything was, was really, um, you know, sensationalized, I guess is a good way to put it. And we have some really, really big, uh, ground hornets in Florida. And this is a common one. And so people will find this and, and they're, they're scared and, and reasonably so that the murder hornet has made it to Florida. And of course we have a huge honeybee industry. So that is a major concern. Um, not just that they look scary, but the impact that that actual, you know, insect does have on, on that industry. Um, but this one, the target is cicadas. So what happens is that they're solitary wasps. So a lot of our um, a lot of our wasps and bees are social insects, meaning there's a queen that produces, and you have all these different um, insects within that society that have particular roles. Well, this is not a social insect. This is a solitary wasp. Um, a lot of times with solitary wasps, though, you will see multiple burrows or multiple nests in the same area, and that technically, or typically, that's because if the conditions are good for one, the conditions are probably good for others too. And so we tend to, to see more than one in, in one, one area. But the female creates a burrow and it has uh, several different branches and cells. And she will um, find a cicada, sting it to immobilize it, carry it to her nest, and she'll put it down into the cell. She may put one to four, depending on the size of the cicada. And then she will um, lay egg, an egg on, on, in, on the host. Um, one thing that I read that I thought was really interesting was that um, the female knows the gender of the egg and they tend to lay the female eggs on the larger cicadas I guess because there's more um, food source for them, which is kind of interesting. And they close off the cells. Uh, I mentioned they're solitary wasps, but they have um, been observed where there are um, several females. I think it said up to four that have been observed actually helping to um, bring cicadas into one nest network. Um, so in, who knows, they may eventually evolve into some form of a social insect. But right now, we, they are definitely what we consider a solitary wasp. So as you can imagine, I have completely skipped a bunch of insects. There's no way that I can talk about every type of predator, every type of parasitoid, um, that you may run across in your Florida garden. And so I made a list of honorable mentions and this again does not encompass everything. Um, we have a lot of predatory stink bugs, wheel bugs, big eyed bugs, pirate bugs, assassin bugs, damsel bugs. All of those fall into the, um, the order of uh, Hemiptera and uh, where are true bugs. And you notice I do call them bugs because they're bugs. We also have robber flies and paper wasps, you know, we don't think about paper wasps as being predators, but they, they are, they'll actually capture, um, you know, they'll, they'll eat some and they'll, they'll provide for their, their babies. Uh, predatory mites, which of course we don't really see those because they're so tiny, but there are um, mites that, that eat other mites and other insects. And spiders, there are so many spiders. Um, I took this picture, oh, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago when I was about ready to pull up my zinnias. And um, the green link spider, that's kind of an ambush um, predator. You know, a lot of spiders form webs and things get into them. But these, all this summer, anytime I went out to, to 
um, just love to look for bugs because that's what I do. Um, I could find link spiders hanging out on my zinnias and especially on the underside and then things would fly over and they would grab it. And um, this one caught a, a skipper, which is a pretty good sized butterfly. And um, so when I pulled the zinnias up, I relocated it so it could finish its meal because it had got the butterfly anyway. So let's just go ahead and finish that little cycle of life. But there are, there are a lot of insects that are really, really helping with your pest management strategies. So I want to show you, I'm not just, um, I, I'm not just telling you to do this. This is something I actually do myself. Um, I live in the northern part of Bay County, so it does get pretty cold at my house. I'm not, you know, along the, the water, so I'm probably a good, you know, eight, zone eight cold hardiness. And I have firebush, uh, Hemelia patens, that every year it gets huge. It gets six foot tall, five foot wide, but the frost knocks it back. You think it's dead. It's not quite dead. My husband cuts it back, and then it starts to flush out. And every spring, this is what I see. Distorted foliage and just looking like it's just not going to make it. It's a mess. Um, I get up close and I've got aphids. I've got mealybugs. I've just got everything under the sun feeding on this tender new foliage. It looks terrible. But if I look closer, I always find predators. Um, here on the picture on the right hand side, you see I have some mealybug destroyers. I'm sure there were probably some lady beetles in there too. Um, who knows? Yeah, but, so, this is how bad this shrub looked this spring. I didn't do anything, nothing. I applied no insecticides, didn't fertilize it. it. It doesn't even get watered, okay? I just left it alone. And this is what it looked like this weekend. It's huge, it's doing great. As you can see, close up of the foliage, no distortion, no honeydew, no sooty mold. There wasn't an aphid in sight. There wasn't a mealybug in sight. Um, because I just, I, I let nature take its course. I let the predators come in and do what they wanted to do, and I didn't have to do anything. That isn't always the case, but you kind of learn. You watch and learn, and sometimes you have to live with something looking really pitiful for a while, and if you don't mess with things, it'll, it'll right itself. Um, some of our predators and parasitoids are more susceptible to insecticides that we use than the pests we're trying to target. So we really need to be uh, really mindful of when we, we do need to take action. And sometimes you do, sometimes you do need to use a pesticide and, and I do in certain situations. Um, but it's not my first choice. It's not the first thing that I do. Um, and then when I do, I try to make it as very selective and specific as possible because I don't want it to um, impact my natural enemies that will go a long way towards managing pests a lot further than I can do. So I did want to mention um, a couple of must have bug books if you're into entomology. These are two fantastic books um, that we offer through our IFAS bookstore. And one of them is the um, an identification, identification guide to common insect spiders and more backyard bugs. And the other one is helpful, harmful, or harmless insects. And they have great pictures and good descriptions um, and just, just really, really well written and good photography. So I would highly recommend those books if you are interested in learning more about these topics. So I'm open for questions, Rachel. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. Yeah, that was awesome, Julie. Um, we did get some questions come in. So folks that are still there, um, uh, you all can, we'll go through these questions. And if something comes up, please put that in the chat and we'll keep up with them. Uh, Julie, yeah, that was great. Um, will you just, uh, when you were thinking, you know, you were cracking me up with all of your, you know, constantly collecting new things and bringing weird stuff into your house and your daughter, you know, being over, you know, uh, overwhelmed by all your bug pictures and your phone roll. But uh, at the end, you mentioned, you know, making sure you, that's not the first thing you do is go get the, the pesticide, you know, and mm -hmm. I was thinking the first thing you do is take pictures and collect yes. them in your office. <laughs> and watch and see it do all these, you know, gruesome things. But, you know, that's a great message for folks, you know, Florida friendly landscaping, trying to reduce your pesticide use. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great. So let's see here some questions. Um, 
Towards the beginning of the talk, you mentioned biological controls. Uh, I think you were talking about the air potato beetle. Do these mm -hmm. um, do these biological controls eliminate the pest that you know they're going after? No, they don't. So that, that's a really good question. With biological control, there's a balance, um, and when when we introduce biological control insects, say. The reason that we can do that safely is because it has a very, very limited food source. So in the instance of the air potato leaf beetle, it only feeds on air potato vine, nothing else. It doesn't even feed on um, some really closely related species of, of vine. So if the insect ate all of it and eradicated it, it would in effect kill itself because it depends on that very, very specific nutrient source in order to reproduce and, and exist. And so really the biological control becomes um, a means of suppression and management. It does not eliminate the problem. Because yeah, yeah, it kind of helps, it kind of helps us catch up to it, huh? Yeah. Uh, and f related to that, you know, some people get a little bit, uh, a little bit anxious or nervous about releasing these biological mm -hmm. controls. So can you go over and you mentioned, you know, there's some, you know, they're it's specific, but are these things safe? You know, do we need to worry when they say, oh, we got a new, I think the recent one was for Brazilian pepper, which is a terrible scourge down in central and south Florida. But you Yeah, know, I think they released a thrift. Thrips for that. Yeah, and so people were concerned, like, oh no, here's some other biological control. Can you just talk about, you know, the safety of these things briefly? Right. It 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 really goes through a a long long testing period. It is not something that happens quickly. Um, it, you know, USDA and on the national level, your Department of Agriculture at your state level, your research scientists at your universities. You know, there are a lot of, of entities involved in that whole process. And, and I, I don't know enough to speak on the specific steps, but it's, I, I can tell you, it is not something that happens quickly. And there are a whole lot of things that they consider and they look at and they find that it, it could impact native species or other species besides their, their target. And, and that gets off the, you know, on the chopping block. Um, yeah. um, I know, I think I read somewhere decades that, of research and it doesn't come to fruition. Yeah. I think it takes like sometimes 10 years for these things to go through like an approval process of testing. I, I think that's probably pretty, pretty typical is 10 years. I, I think that's, that's probably a good average if I had to guess. Yes. All right. Appreciate it. Um, we had a good question about dragonflies. Do dragonflies have a venomous sting? They don't sting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, they, you know, I suppose if you caught one and were handling it, it could probably bite you. Um, but I'm, I'm not familiar with them having any stinging apparatus. Yeah, I've had several of them land on me and they usually don't, I'm not trying to mm -hmm. harass them at all, but they usually just hang out for a little bit and then fly away. Yeah. I was considered it kind of good luck when a dragonfly or a lady beetle lands on you, right? Mm -hmm. And I also mess up with lady bug and la it's lady beetle and I will do my, my best to stick Oh, just like you, I'm going to try to always say Lady Beetle. Um, there was a there was a comment on how common names are confusing, and they use the example of doodle bugs are synonymous with pill bugs or roly polies in Texas. So I don't know if you want uh, to talk about common names of insects real quick, or just you know. Yeah, and and you know normally I do include the Latin names on in, on insects and plants in any presentation. And I didn't on this one, partly because I was not always talking about specific species. I was covering kind of general generalizations and general um, groups of insects. But, but that's true. Common names, uh, I mean, even from just different regions of Florida, we may have people that are in the panhandle that call one insect or plant one thing and you go down to central or south Florida and the, it, it's referring to something else. So. So, you know, it is really important to use the, um, the botanical names or the Latin names or the scientific names of 
specific species because um, because you can can definitely run into some overlap. I mean, we see that with plants all the time too. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's up with the lady beetles that gather on the house? So you mentioned lady beetles, you mentioned some of them that aren't native, but what are, you know, we've had calls, especially when it gets cooler, there'll be lady beetles, you know, all over the, the side of the house, or sometimes they get in the house. In the house. Fixtures. So what's up with those things? Yeah, that, that is a problem. A lot of times it's that multicolored Asian lady beetle um, that will congregate in inside homes or, or against homes. And, and um, unfortunately, if you try to smush them, they'll stain. So, um, you know, as far as keeping them from getting inside the house, you, know, you always want to just use good exclusionary practices on your home to help just prevent any type of insects from coming in. Make sure you have good caulking around your doors and windows, use screens. You know, don't just leave the door open. Um, but if they do get in, you you know, the best thing is just to vacuum them, um, to dispose of them. I, I don't remember wh why. I'm sure they're attracted to warmth or, or something, you know. I, I know when I lived in Alabama, um, I, I had a spare room that we hardly ever used. And I, you know, somehow I wouldn't go in there for two, two or three weeks. And in the wintertime, every single winter, the lady beetles got in. I would have just a mass of them. And I usually just left them alone. Wasn't using the room anyways. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, actually, uh, this came up, but I think you answered it. So some books and other resources to show, especially the various life stages, because I think what you showed mm -hmm. is that there's things that we're familiar with, but if you see them in another kind of life form, right in their larval stage or nymph stage, maybe that we may not recognize it and think it's something bad. So I think you did mm -hmm. bring up those books and the one is definitely my favorite. I usually keep it right close by here. The good bug, bad bug, benign bug uh, book. Uh, but any, you know, any other resources you want to add to that? Um, definitely the featured creatures website um, through IFAS. Um, that is, is really great. It's maintained by the um, entomology and nematology department at University of Florida. And what I could do is I can add that into the, um, I know uh, Rachel wanted me to send the PDF of the presentation, so I'll add the featured creatures website. Um, but that one usually has photos of all the different life stages and, and it's, it's usually pretty condensed, it's pretty brief. We do have some EDIS publications um, out also through UF, but a lot of times those tend to be a little longer um, than the featured creature article. So that's a really, really good one. Um, yeah, and, and Rachel just put it in the chat, but we will send out, uh, everyone that signed up for this, we have your email, so we will send out the slides and the links after the mm -hmm. webinar. Mm -hmm. um, that the Good Bug, Bad Bug book that you mentioned, I think Dr. Dale is one of the authors on that one. And uh, this. Yeah, the little flip book. Uh, we yes. have Master Gardener volunteers that, you know, that's their grandkids' favorite, you know, book now. They just <laughs> like to go, you know, go through it. So from, you know, senior citizens to little kids. Uh, everyone is going to love that book. Um, really well done. Are there other insects that lay similar eggs as the um, on stalks like the lace wings? I don't know. Um, okay. Probably, but I, I don't know off the top of my head, but there, there could be. I mean, that's a really good strategy to avoid um, predation. Um, I think their question came up because they're, you know, they find them in all these random places. I think you showed the one on the screen, sometimes mm -hmm. they're all inside of a chair, like a lawn, you know, something out in the yard. Uh, but those are most likely their lace bug eggs, right? I mean. Lace wing, yes. Lace wing, yes, sorry. Lace wing, I would just leave them. Um, okay. Yeah, but I've seen them on like um, umbrellas, on patio furniture, on patio furniture, sides of buildings, windows. Um, Usually when they're on the, what, what I've just observed is they tend to be like in that circular pattern also, like a spiral or circular pattern. Okay. Um, oh, oh, this was from me. Cause when you were bringing up the trash, the, uh, the, hold on the, not the trash bug, but the, when you were going over the lace wing larvae and it has that's a trash bug. That's, uh, that's okay. That's same as uh -huh. a trash bug. Do you yeah. want to talk about some insects I know have what's called a fecal shield? I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to bring up fecal shields, right? or, or maybe not. 
Um, I'm actually not familiar with that term. Now I know that some insects will like project their poop away from them so that predators can't find them as easily. Well, the, uh, there was something that came up that, uh, and Martha Williams was put in here. She said she was thinking of fecal shields too, uh, sumac beetles. I know there's a couple oh. of these wackadoo insects and insects are fascinating. You said, they are. you know, they got, basically they poop and hold on to it and like kind of collect it over themselves as a, as a method of defense. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Insects are, are amazing. Um, is there an easy way to tell a predatory stink bug from the bad stink bugs? Yes, so the, the shape of their, so they all have um, a proboscis or kind of like a beak shaped um, mouth part. It's actually composed of multiple different uh, mouth parts. Typically your plant feeders, they lay flat against the, um, well, the head and maybe even down to the abdomen of the, of the insect. Um, kind of tucked in almost and then on your predators it tends to have like a curve to it and it's just a little more stout. The the plant feeders is, is real fine and thin for the most part. And again these are general out you know generalizations um, but that that's a big thing and then just watching them too what they do. Um, I know a lot of the a lot of the predatory stink bugs will kind of hide out and just be kind of waiting and not doing anything Whereas your, um, your plant feeders are most likely going to tap into a plant and start feeding. Although I also have noticed um, just this summer, I noticed some assassin bugs that were um, feeding on nectar of some mint plants that I had. And you know, the, the nectar is obviously really high sugar um, content. And so Sometimes, you know, your predators have other needs. Sometimes they're feeding on pollen too, or sometimes they're feeding on nectar. So, so they, they could actually be feeding on plants, but they're not generally going to, um, you're not really normally going to see a whole lot of crossover between like the ones that are sap feeders that are really causing a lot of damage to the foliage and the stems of the plants. So no. and I'm going to say never because there's way too many insects for me to know about all of them. So you know, I, I've heard of the the pokey shoulder pads. Yeah, I've heard some things about that too, about the spine, but I never can remember which is which. I usually just look at their face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll start looking more at those stink bug faces, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, so what are some practices to make sure that you are attracting as many of these predators as possible? What can you do to help make sure these are around and helping you out with your pests? Well, um, I guess you'd have to let the pests live. <laughs> really just, just landscape diversity is really what it boils down to. You know, you want to have a lot of different type of plant material, um, you know, when you get into a monoculture situation, and, and, I, and I don't mean turf grass, I know a lot of people don't like turf, I love turf, I love lawn area, play space, recreational use, um, but I also have a lot of bed space in my yard, and I, I plant a lot of different kind of shrubs and flowers, I do annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, grasses, I mean, there's just having a wide variety of plant material in place will bring a wide variety of insects is, is really what it comes down to. And then also just, just responsible pesticide use. Um, if you are using broad spectrum pesticides, insecticides, meaning that they, you know, can impact a lot of different insects. And these are the ones that a lot of people are attracted to when they go to the store because they look at the bag and they're like, okay, for $20, I can get this bag that will kill grubs and caterpillars and ants and you know they start checking off like 90 different types of insects and that sounds like a good deal or it sounds like a bargain for the consumer but what that really means is that this that product is is going to impact all of your insect or arthropod activity including spiders a lot of times and so you end up where things kind of get out of balance. And so again, if you need to use a pesticide, try to use one that is the most selective as possible. 
So if you're having a caterpillar problem, try to get one that's just for caterpillars. If you're having, you know, if you're trying to manage mosquitoes, try to do something selective for mosquitoes, whatever your issue is, try to avoid using broad spectrum, non-selective insecticides. And if you do need to use them, follow the label instructions to a T. Do not use a different rate than what's on the label. Don't use it more frequently. You know, these things that I hear people tell me all the time, these mistakes that, that people make, you can really have a big impact on, on your insect diversity, which includes your predators. Okay, thanks, great answer. Uh, and I like it. you gotta leave a little bit of the pest too, right? So you gotta handle a little bit yeah. of the damage. Yeah. yeah, just like your biological control. I mean, if I had, had, you know, if I went out and every time I saw aphids in my landscape, you know, put out even a hort oil or whatever. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm going to accidentally get some of my predators. And then if I eliminate their food source, they're not going to hang around. So tolerance. Uh, this, this one came up and you can pass if you'd like, but you know, there was a release, I guess, of GMO mosquitoes down in the Keys. Um, do you want to talk about that? Or have, you they, wanna... have they released them yet? I know, well, well, about I know they were voting on it or something. I don't know if it's actually happened quite yet. Um, yeah, actually they, um, no, that, yeah, it should be occurring. I don't know if it's occurred yet. I don't know a lot of the specifics about it. Let me think about it for a second because I, <laughs> so if I, if I remember correctly, what those particular I can't remember. It, it has an impact on the reproductive cycle. Um, and, and it is in one of our invasive mosquito species that transmits diseases. And specifically, one of the reasons that they were um, looking at, at doing this was because of dengue. Because there has been dengue transmission from mosquitoes in the, in the Keys. Uh, and recent, not, you know, we're not talking decades ago. We're talking about this happens almost every year. Um, and so the mosquito control um, district worked with a company to, to, to develop um, some mosquitoes that they could release. So I'm actually attending a training in a couple of weeks where I'll learn more about it. But, um, you know, perfect. Maybe you can come back for another talk and tell us more all about it. Yeah, yeah. Or, or probably better would be to invite somebody from the Florida Medical Entomology Lab to do it. So yeah, it's actually um, a good. Um, I'll try to find that link. The Florida Entomology Lab is a Florida Medical Entomology Lab. Medical Entomology, yeah. It's FML. A, tell us about it. Tell us about it. I'm gonna find the link and I'll put it in the chat. Well, it's part of the university. It's um part of the University of Florida IFAS um program, and so of course you know mosquitoes are a huge, huge public health. Um, issue. Um, they're, you know, mosquitoes are the most dangerous animal in the world because they transmit so many diseases and so many diseases that are fatal. Um, you know, there are a lot that are, are just, um, not just, but, you know, can make you ill or flu-like symptoms, or there's some that are debilitating, have long, long-lasting um, symptoms, and there's some that are deadly. Um, malaria, dengue, um, Gosh, I'm sure there's there's more that are, are you know we would consider deadly, but we also we have West Nile virus, um, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, uh, chikungunya, Zika. I mean, there's so many diseases they're capable of transmitting that that it's it's really important that that the mosquito control districts have every tool um, available to them, and and the genetically modified mosquitoes is a way to reduce the amount of insecticide and pesticides that need to be put out because it helps to reduce um, the reproduction um, uh, effectiveness of that particular species. Yeah, I think it was something where the they were GMO, like the males are sterile or something. I, I can't exactly remember the the, the way. Yeah, I think that. Now they 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 did do um, they they do a lot of um, sterile male insect programs or not a lot but there are some other ones I think with this one they actually can reproduce but the I think that they do mate they're not actually sterile but there's been some type of a modification that the um, the either the egg is not viable or the larvae doesn't progress past a certain stage something along those lines if I remember correctly but you're on the right track so um, all right um, 
air potato leaf beetles do you mm-hmm. know can and and i think i've asked some questions so i can help you out here but do you know what the status is with this air potato leaf beetle program can they still get some i don't know if there's any available right now um there there were some grants where uf was raising them and, and releasing them we, we did a pro- big program up here in bay county and we released um, a lot and distributed them to landowners so that they could put them out um, that particular program with UF, I believe, um, has ended, but Department of Agriculture still has rearing labs and was still trying to distribute them. I, I think that the, the main problem right now has been um, with COVID and just limiting our availability to do events. I don't know how that has impacted their rearing facility. I know earlier this year we were um, collecting potatoes to provide for the lab so that they could continue to grow the vine to support the beetles, to, to have more beetles for the public. Um, but I have not checked in with them since we've, you know, we're getting back into more routine. Uh, it is getting kind of late in the year for North Florida though. So even if they have them available, it's, it's probably too late to put them out, but hopefully next spring, early summer, I'm, I'm very hopeful that there are some available um, for distribution, but my, the last I knew, uh, you needed to make a request through Department of Agriculture, not through UF. Yeah, I think the, yeah, you're right. I think there's something like that. There's a form somewhere and it goes to the mm-hmm. Department of Ag. I think they are prioritizing places where they know the beetles aren't established. So mm-hmm. one thing I'd recommend, uh, I can't remember who asked the question, but if you, um, you know, think you have air potato, the the plant um, you don't see any beetles but you think they're in the neighborhood just make sure that it's not the winged yam because there's a very closely related plant species that looks almost identical um, the fruits are different but the plant you know the leaf and the, everything else kind of looks similar and they do not have a taste for that one whatsoever it's only it's the same yeah. genus and species but they will not touch it so uh, i know that's confused some folks uh, here in tallahassee area All right, let's see. Question, Julie, about oleander aphids. So they're uh, multiplying in mass and they're Mm -hmm. on on a milkweed, uh, which they're growing for monarchs. This person's growing for monarchs and Mm -hmm. small small numbers. Okay, but what do you recommend to control the large number of aphids on the milkweeds without using pesticides harmful for monarchs? Squish. (laughs) I mean, that's gonna be the simplest thing. Most likely if you look um, uh, actually out here on my milkweed um, where, and, and I, I hate, I missed this category. I forgot to expand on it is the surface flies, um, hover flies. So those, those larvae. So I went out and looked, I was, cause I would go out and look for bugs. So my uh, milkweed was just covered up with aphids and I looked and there were mummified aphids, which showed that indicates um, parasitoid activity could be flies or wasps. Um, I had surfed fly larvae, which looks like looks like a booger. I don't know what else to describe it. Look it up. There's a good picture of some in, in this little book here. But that was there. That was something that was feeding. Um, I had the lace wing um, eggs and um, lady beetle larvae. So there may already be several different predators present, but if there's not, um, then really a pretty simple thing is just scrape them off and squish them. They're really, really soft. It's very easy to do. You can wear gloves if that grosses you out, um, but that's that's probably the safest thing. And you can be very, yeah, I guess, selective, very selective. Uh, I guess I'll add sometimes you can use a um, stream of like water from the hose, like the jet spray with your you know, hose nozzle, just knock them off. Uh, And I think Mary brought this up last week, I think, or last class, Rachel, where she mentioned, I think she recommended just kind of leave them. um, Yeah. Her her recommendation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Here's another one. So do our, let's see, do any damaging uh, mouth feeding or other insects tend to disappear or reappear during the cooler months in say, North Florida versus South Florida. So damaging, so caterpillars and, you know, uh, maybe um, 
maybe aphids or something that, you know, mouth feeders that disappear and reappear during the cooler months? Yeah, I, I mean, we definitely see a decline in insect activity when our temperatures get low. Um, and, you know, the thing is, our, our temperatures fluctuate and um, it, it really is just going to depend on, you know, some, some insects kind of are cued in more to soil temperature, some are more air temperature. Um, you know, if we're getting down into, you know, really cold at night or freezing, they definitely slow down. And, you know, some of them spend, you know, it might be that you just don't, you don't really see any because they're overwintering as um, eggs or sometimes they're overwintering as, um, as pupa if they're, you know, have that more complex life cycle, or sometimes they just go into um, diapause, which is kind of like insect hibernation, where they just, um, they're, they slow down and, and almost go to sleep until the conditions are right. And so, you know, you'll, you may actually see like through the winter where you don't see any insects at all, or, or hardly any insects. And then we have like three or four days where it's 70 degrees, and then you start seeing a little bit of activity and then the temperature drops and you don't see them again. They're just very tuned into, you know, moisture availability and, and temperature. And then of course a food source. So if you have a, a plant feeder that is dependent on a particular type of plant and that plant is deciduous and we get a cold snap where the foliage all falls off, then even if it wanted to be active because the temperatures were cooperative, if it doesn't have anything to eat, it's going to have to either go through going to diapause again and wait until there's nutrition available or it's going to die. So, you know, and there's, there's definitely some insects that we will see some that will die if it's, if the temperatures get cold enough. Um, but they, they have cycles and sometimes it's too hot for bugs too, believe it or not. <laughs> mm. So we, we kind of see, see varying levels of populations depending on the, the weather throughout the year. Uh, Marty just asked if we're going to provide this. We are recording this. She wants to know there's going to be a link and we will, um, yeah, we'll figure that out. And uh, I think we're going to send the video to Julie. We'll, we'll ask Julie which, where she might uh, post it, uh, but we'll figure that out and we'll let you guys know with the email when we supply you with the slides and the, you know, some other links. Uh, so let's see, here's one. Let me, let me read through this one. This was a longer one but it had to do with these bronze colored predatory wasp that were preying on the monarch caterpillar. Okay, mm -hmm. so not sure what the wasps were, but do they, the, the person's wondering if these wasps can communicate to other wasps, kind of, I guess I'm thinking to like, let them know there's more stuff over here, um, you know, to eat. And um, other than kind of swatting them, is there a way to control predatory wasps this is similar predator is there a way to control some of these insects without using pesticides so these predatory yeah. wasps that might be going after her monarch uh caterpillars what can she do what i don't you know i don't know which which one it is but you know obviously it would have to be tolerant of the um you know some of the chemicals that they take in from the milkweed plant um i mean it could be paper wasps even i'm not really sure which ones are 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 tolerant and able to eat them. I, as far as multiple, you know, seeing a lot of wasps coming, they, I don't know, it would, if it's a social insect, maybe they are communicating like honeybees do about food sources. Um, I'm really not sure. But, you know, typically if, if it's a site that's conducive to, it's a food source for one, the other ones figure, can figure it out too. Um, as far as trying to prevent, the only thing I could think of is exclusion. Uh, which would be to prevent them from coming in. So I know, actually from speaking of Mary, I've seen Mary get these real fine mesh bags and put them over seed heads when she's gonna collect seed of plants. I mean, I guess if you wanted to build a screened enclosure around your milkweed. Maybe those things they sell for the picnic so the flies don't get on your food. If yeah, like I mean, if it's a small plant, that might work. You just wanna make sure that there is still enough, you know, airflow and, and everything for the plant. Um, you know, the other thing is if you wanted to, like I have a butterfly cage and so I'll raise caterpillars a lot, but that means you've got to continuously bring them that fresh food source. And let me tell you, they poop a lot. It is a mess. 
to clean up after caterpillars. Um, so you got to have a commitment, <laughs> but that's an option, but I really don't know of any insecticide, um, product that, that would deter the wasps and not hurt the other insects. I also think about the, you know, every now and again, we get a question about, um, you know, what to do with a, a snake or something going up a bird feeder or the hawk, oh. the birds as they eat at the bird feeder. You know, everything's got to eat, even including that stinking yeah. wasp that's, you know, laying its eggs in the monarch. So maybe, you know, one way is that you have, you have a bunch of other milkweed plants supporting some other monarch caterpillars that will, you know, also make it to uh, adulthood. So yeah, everything's got to It's kind of the circle of life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I put in the chat earlier when you were talking about, you know, all these, uh, when you were bringing up those stereotypes of, you know, insects or bugs uh, as mm -hmm. being filthy, but how important they are. Uh, in that song from the Lion King was going off in my head. Uh, <laughs> well, folks, we've read, we've reached all the questions that have come in so far. So if you have more questions regarding insects uh, that you would like Julie to uh, go over, we'll take those. And then we'll, uh, also, is, open, we'll also open sorry. up a general gardening question. So go ahead, Evelyn, what you got? Sorry, um, about a month ago, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I saw like a bunch of oleander caterpillars on my two oleander bushes. And I decided I'm not going to give up bringing the big guns. And so me and a neighborhood kid just hosed them off. Mm -hmm. right, that was about a month ago. There were maybe a hundred of them or more. They came back, that didn't work. And now it's decimated. There's hardly any leaves. So should I give up, cut it down? Um, just maybe prune it back, see what happens in the spring. I wouldn't, I, I don't think I'd, I don't know that I'd prune it right now. We're getting kind of close to a first frost date. Um, Cause you know, if you prune it, you're going to stimulate new growth and you're also going to remove woody tissue that has a lot of um, energy reserves in it. So if it were me, if I could stand to look at it, I would just leave it and see what happens next spring. I should prune it in the spring though, right? I mean, it's all, the, it looks horrible. It's yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you, you can, but I, I, I don't, I, I mean, it probably can tolerate it. A lot of these, a lot of these real specific insect plant relationships um, can tolerate some major defoliation and some major um, loss, but, you know, when you start talking about woody shrubs, um, you know, we know that they, they contain a lot of um, stored energy in the woody tissue of the plant and they'll use that to flush out new leaves. Well, they need the leaves to capture sunlight for photosynthesis, to replenish the energy stores. You know, like there's this whole cycle that goes on there. Um, so, I mean, I wouldn't prune it now because you're gonna stimulate leaf growth and we could get a cold snap in early November and the leaves aren't hardened off and they damage and then you've just wasted that energy that the plant um, used. In the spring, you could, I would just definitely wait till after your last frost date so that um, when it does put on new leaf growth, it, it should keep them, you know, and it, and it may leaf out on its own right now. It, it's, it just depends on what the weather does. Um, All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I'll add Evelyn, there's, um, you know, next year when you see them, now that you know that the, the hose may not be enough and they'll keep decimating your oleander, um, you know, BT would be a product that mm -hmm. would be more specific to caterpillars and maybe not harm. Uh, That's some... a joke, Mark. I had a big container of BT and I didn't want to use it. I wanted to try on the other ah, okay. <laughs> right. You yeah. gotta do it early when they're little. You gotta yeah. do it yeah, early. Well, if you wait till they're time. big fat ones, it's not gonna be effective. Yeah, well, they were pretty big and fat before this master gardener noticed them. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Well, you know, you're trying, Evelyn. You're right, following all those Florida friendly principles and observing. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't use the hose on them, though. It doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you. Well, see, you, you have to step on them afterwards. I've, I've stepped on a bunch of them. I'm, oh. I'm, into, okay. I'm into massacre now. They're all, <laughs> over the, they're all over the sides of the house, crawling up to the roof. It's crazy. Wow. Uh. You know? Yeah, they're really uh, going nuts. Insects are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Aren't they? Uh, they're, out to win. they're out to win, I'll tell you. They are. Uh, they will, they were here before us and they'll probably be here long after us. <laughs> um, 
the in so uh, question that just came in the chat julie are there insects that stay in the ground for years before they emerge similar to the locusts or termites so are there some other insects that are kind of you know known for this staying in the ground for a while before they emerge cicadas do cicadas cicadas do yeah i mean they can spend a decade or better underground uh, before they emerge um, i'm sure there's others there's some i'm sure there's lots of insects that we never see that just their entire life cycle is in the soil. Yeah, it was a, there was a question I got from, a, I think it was a master gardener volunteer about the blueberry bee. And why don't you ever see it the whole rest of the year? And if they're specialists on blueberries, how come you don't see them? You know, uh, you know, what do they eat the rest of the year? And basically we found that they hang out for the most of the time, they're just in the ground in their um, larval stage or they're in diapause or something or other. So. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole lot going on in the ground too, right? That uh, there is, that and, and there needs to be. That's that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we got a question on when and how did you prune your fire bush? Um, usually, um, well, it'll it'll when we get a hard frost, it'll look pretty bad, um, and we usually just leave it through the winter, and then in the spring, um, we'll cut it back. Uh, about when it's warm enough and we feel like it's about ready to flush out, um, just take it down to 12 inches from the ground and it's always come back so far. It's slow. It needs, you know, it has to warm up. It's not the, the first thing to flush out, you know, and every year you kind of go, huh, maybe it's not coming back, but it has for about six or seven years. So. <laughs> yeah, ours do the same. We have a bunch here at the demo garden. They do the same thing where they'll, um, yeah. typically they'll die back and they come back as this multi-stem shrub. I mean, we mm -hmm. do the, the basic of, you know, prune out the dead ones, uh, the crossing ones, and, you know, then it's a matter of how big you can let it get, right? So um, you know, ours has gotten quite large. Yeah, and it's always, you know, that's a great native shrub that just takes a really tough conditions, and it's always got so many insects at it. Um, yeah. Another one that's really, um, that is, is great for, if you like to look for bugs like me, is the um, dotted horse mint. Uh, Monarda what, punctuata, I think, or something Punteta, like that. Yeah. Um, which that one to me a lot of times dies back and then reseeds and comes back somewhere else. But that's a really cool one if you like bugs. Uh, all right, anyone want to? Anyone got a question you want to unmute and ask about la landscaping related? <laughs> Or you can put it in the chat if you don't want to. Uh, you don't want to unmute yourself. Any questions? Bring them in. Uh, let's see. Let me think if I can have a question for you, Julie. Um, do you have a? What is your favorite creepy predatory insect? Um, you know I really like the mantids. I think they're really really cool. Um, I also I like dragonflies a lot too. Yeah, dragonflies are awesome. Yeah, and by really the way, Peter Gorin's on the call. He's the one who took that amazing picture. So Peter, I think uh, oh, yes. Julie, Julie wanted to ask if she had your permission to uh, use that herself as well. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, thank you. thank you. I'll ask Rachel to send it to me and, and make sure she spelled, you know, gives me the spelling of your name so I can credit you properly. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was, we were talking about it yesterday. It was so cool. It was just following me around as I was trying to get a good shot. It's just, it's, it's very eerie with when you're messing with those. Does they turn their heads or? Yeah, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, they're neat. Uh, all right, uh, we have someone that has a very bad stink bug problem um, on their garden, and they're trying to use organic, you know, uh, methods. Right, they're trying to have an organic garden. Uh, they seem to have taken over and love eating the tomatoes and other veggies. Yeah, that's that sounds like them. Um, they're using right now a small butterfly net to catch them, but most mm -hmm. get away before she can. That sounds like a lot of fun. So <laughs> any, any comments for uh, organic type methods to help mm -hmm. with the stink bugs? Oh gosh, yeah, that's, that's tough. You know, again, exclusion. I know with tomatoes, I usually recommend that you just go ahead and pick the fruit as soon as they start to get any kind of, you know, pink or orangey color at all. They'll still taste good if they ripen in the house um in, instead of leaving them on the plant um they're they can be tough to catch they, they definitely can um you know you could 
try to spray them off with water and catch them. You could trap crop. Maybe that's probably the best answer. So they're really drawn to um, sunflowers. And there's probably some other trap crop. Of course, that's not going to do a whole lot of good in the wintertime. But in the summertime, um, you could, and usually, I think if I remember correctly for, for trap cropping is that, say, say there's a, um, you kind of want to know where they're coming from. Um, a lot of times with, um, in agriculture, you know, you have your field of your crop and then it's bordered by kind of natural areas, tree lines, shrubs, scrubby areas. And a lot of times your insects, you know, that's where they can shelter and harbor and then they come and attack the, the, the food crop. And so when they're trap cropping, they would put the, the trap crop, such as sunflowers, in between um, there. And so they're attracted to that. But you can't just plant that and just assume that the stink bugs are only gonna go there. If you trap crop, it's a trap, and then you can catch them and kill them from there. So, and again, you can still use your mechanical methods. You don't have to use insecticide on the sunflowers, you know, and that, that's good because you can just leave them for whatever other insects. But, um, and there may be some other, uh, I'm sure there's some other plant species that you could use to do trap cropping with. So that would be something to look at too. Yeah, I'm trying to think of you know, organic, um, you know, pesticides that would be considered organic. The problem with stink bugs is you can really only they're only effective when they're nymphs or something. And even then it's kind of tricky. So they're really hard to control, even with like full blown, you know, synthetic pesticides. Um, yeah. Yeah. The problem with a lot of your, especially the adult insects, which I, I mean, I'm not, the nymphs are going to cause damage too. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's not, a, it, it, a lot of times it's not a significance. We don't notice it, but once they develop wings, which indicates they're adult reproductive, they can fly. And then it's, it's so hard to, you know, we usually don't even recommend you try to target adult insects because they can get away too easily and you're just not going to, you're not going to get them. And I think that was Kenneth, you know, one thing I did, because I had them on my tomatoes as well. And I used a, a, a pair of pliers, a pair of needle nose pliers. And I told <laughs> someone earlier, I was like pretending I was a bird. And so I would kind of <laughs> pull them and I'd grab those little stink bugs, like with my beak. It was so fun. Um, right. Yeah, if you have a large garden, it's not very practical, but for my couple no. times going, it was kind of fun. Yeah. I, I mean, really your biggest thing, probably your most effective um, thing is scouting, is getting out there and looking and trying to find this stuff when it's little and it's easy to get under control. When, yeah. you know, if you, if you're not out there on a daily basis or almost daily basis, it's like overnight, they're huge and they're just unmanageable. So the uh -oh. next... Can I uh, share something? Sure, go ahead. I'm in my garden right now listening to you guys and about the cover for the stink bug on the tomatoes or the cucumbers. <laughs> yeah. Also, when I do my broccoli, I, I put these little netting. Um, yes. I don't know if you could see it. Yeah. Yeah, we see it. That's great. You could buy it by the yards or it already come pre-cut and you mm -hmm. just high up your plants. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. The, the one thing to, and that's what some people use to try to keep the squash vine borers off of their squash. Uh, the one thing you got to remember is if there's, if they require pollination, you know, some every now and again, it has to be lifted up to allow the, you know, pollinators to get in there and do their, do their thing as well. Mm -hmm. I do. No, that's I great. It's exclusionary method. Yeah. That's a really good way to, uh, a good cultural practice to keep them away mm -hmm. from them. Uh, we have a question here about uh, propagating wild lime and then propagating no Dutchman's pipe. So uh, Dutchman's pipe vine. So uh, as far as the, the wild lime, um, one thing I got to say is that, you know, according to the rules of the state of Florida, you know, all of your citrus should be certified citrus that was raised at a certified nursery because we don't want to um, you know, we don't want to spread disease around. It's going to harm our citrus industry. Now, if this is the wild, like the native lime, uh, Xanthoxylum, and so this is iPad. I don't know your, uh, your name there, iPad, but uh, if it's the native wild lime, what I'm going to do is try to, and for the Dutchman's pipe, I'm going to share a website with you all. And Rachel, isn't the next one of these, is it me doing the next one? Yeah, it's propagation, plant propagation. So should I maybe not answer it and save suspense for next time? Or? No, you can answer. Okay, fine. So check out this website here. 
Uh, oh, it is the native one. Okay. Uh, it is native. Uh, there's this website here that I just put in the chat. This is the landscape plant propagation information page from UF IFAS, the horticulture department. And there you can actually look up plants by common name or scientific name, and it will give you the, the preferred method of, you know, reproducing these plants. So um, Xanthoxylum is a woody, more of a woody plant. My guess is going to be, you know, maybe some type of, uh, it's actually not in there. Uh, they don't have all the plants in there. Um, my guess for that one would be some type of cutting, like maybe a, I don't know if it would be, the thing is a check would be a softwood, semi-hardwood or hardwood cutting. A lot of woody plants, those, those hardwood cuttings are what you would use. Um, uh, or some, t I think that would be the only thing I could think of for the wild lime. Now the Dutchman's pipe that one I'm going to look up too. I'm actually looking at the website because I've never tried Dutchman's pipe. Um, we have the native one here and it's doing pretty good. They, they don't have Aristolochia in there either. So we're going to have to, uh, I'll have to do some digging. So uh, iPad or Chrissy, if you want to send me your email, put your email in the chat. Um, I'll try to find some information for you and send that your way. You know, at Extension, especially when we take uh, rando questions, uh, we're, we're always safe to say we don't know the answer and we'll try to get you the best information later. We'll have to look that one up. Um, any other questions that are out there? So Rachel put the link in there for um, next week's, uh, or in two weeks, in two weeks, the next lawn and landscape session that we're doing. Um, and it will be on propagation. So we'll talk about all the different ways and the pros and the cons and where to find some more resources. Um, uh, any questions? Anyone to unmute and ask a plant propagation question? I hope, oh wait, did Julie, you yes. did answer your, the favorite predatory insect? Was yes. that the mantis? The, yeah, the mantids and the dragonflies. The dragonfly, that's right. Okay, making sure I got um, that. Okay. I got I got one that we missed back up here. Um, okay. So they have a monarch caterpillar that's hanging from the underside of the milkweed leaf that's obviously dead. Uh, and it seemed mm. to be trying to pupate, but it didn't make it. They assume a predator got to it. Should they leave it alone or take it down? Well, it's, it's a toss up. So um, I, I, I would probably remove it just because there is a possibility that it could be a disease pathogen. Um, there are some pathogens of caterpillars that um, will, the way that they spread is that the insect kind of starts to almost melt out and then it drops the spores down and then infects other insects, other caterpillars. So just on the possibility that it's a disease that caused it, I would probably go ahead and remove it especially if it looks goopy or gross. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I like to take, um, so we had a bunch of fall armyworm caterpillars all over our potatoes this year. So I brought them over to our chickens. So you can oh. always, always give, uh, you know, insects to your chickens, but also if you don't have chickens and you just have a bird feeder, you can, you know, lay them out. Um, like on a platform little bird feeder. feeder. Cause birds got to eat too, right? That's, That's true. Right. Although I don't know on the monarchs, they may not because they- No, they probably won't eat the monarch, but- Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I would probably remove it just in case it's disease related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, anyone else got a question? You want to unmute yourself? Thank Julie uh, or ask a question. Thank you, by the way, Julie, that was great. Fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate being invited and getting to talk about something I get excited about. <laughs> yes, thank you, Julie. Great job. Thank you. We got, we got one on um, native milkweed versus tropical milkweed. You know, why is, why is there, you know, this debate between the two? Um, one of the, the things with tropical milkweed is that it tends to, doesn't, doesn't usually die back in our winters. And so it kind of encourages the monarchs to hang around when they really need to migrate. 
Um, also, they've found that uh, when the, the monarchs stay, I, and I'm not really sure what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, but I, I think that sometimes what happens is that it doesn't necessarily, because it encourages monarchs, it tends to encourage the monarchs that probably wouldn't have made the flight all the way because they're not healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're able to reproduce and continue to perpetuate the pathogen. Um, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's one that causes wing deformity, um, oh, yeah. specific one that's really bad. And so really, I, I do still grow the tropical milkweed, but the recommendation is come Thanksgiving, cut it back. Yeah, and I got a follow up to that. We, that's what we recommend in North Florida. So in South Florida, um, you know, what's the recommendation down there? Because it doesn't dive back. I guess I would say, you know, the monarchs are still gathering at that time of the year all around the whole coast of Florida. So I would say probably statewide um, around Thanksgiving, just cut it down to the ground. Um, or take your cue from the native ones. Yeah. Because a lot of, you know, even if they don't actually um, die back from the cold, some, some of those plants may just be completely defoliated and they just don't bother to, to push leaves out again until like day length changes or, you know, other cues from the environment. So if you're, if you have both in your garden and you may not, if you have both in your garden, then if your native milkweed like looks like it's just gone, it's just disappeared, maybe that's a good time to cut back the, the tropical. But I would probably check with the local extension office about the tropical down there because I can really only speak for what we do up here. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, can I say something? Sure. Regarding the native milkweed, they do lose their leaves. They look like sticks, but they do come back. Yeah. I'm in Broward County. Oh, okay. So, so they they almost they almost do a. a Kind of a, a, a winter. Take a little break. It's probably because it's so darn hot. They just need a little break. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do have both, but I'm trying to eliminate the wild <laughs> or the non-native. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and I just, only have a few native, but they do come back. That's good. That's good. Yeah, and in some parts of the state, the tropical milkweed might be, you know, it, it might be kind of getting out of hand too. I don't know. Up here, it's it's pretty tame. No, yeah. the butterfly loves them both. Good. Yeah, the Good. monarchs, they, they will use those tropical milkweeds as, you know, a source for food uh, for their larvae. Um, the one issue is, again, that OE and that that cue for, for kind of migrating. And someone did mention, I think, I don't know if it came to everyone or to just me, but they have found, and I think, I think Mary brought this up in her last talk. There are, they do think that there are some monarchs that actually don't migrate where they're residents here in Florida and they don't make the, the, the journey uh, across the Gulf. Um, but that might, maybe that's because there's a ton of tropical milkweed. I don't know. So uh, we'll, we'll maybe have to get another uh, milkweed uh, or monarch expert to come talk. Um, what what about, uh, is it Scott Davis over at the? Yeah, we could try to get him Check on. with him. Yeah, we should try to get him on here. You uh, need to talk, hello, you need mm -hmm. to talk to Lorna Bravo in, in Broward County. She is a butterfly or Amy Riley. Okay. Um, they're from the Broward County IFAS extension. All right, well, they can do a Zoom with us. You know, that's the, the one uh, advantage of Zooming everything is that uh, they don't have to be close by. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll check them out at the Broward County office. Yeah, uh, and we do have butterfly monarch here all year long. Great. Uh, thank you. For, uh, several folks on here uh, said that they love these Leon County webinars. I'm glad that you do. Uh, that's why we keep having them. So keep joining us. Um, was there another question that came up here? Hold on a second. Well, one thing I wanted to mention about the milkweeds is that you know, the tropical milkweed, you know, from the nursery perspective, it's really easy to grow the tropical versus the natives, which can have, you know, six foot long tap roots out in the wild. Um, and they can be a lot slower to grow. So, um, you know, it can be hard. You know, I used to work in the nursery and people would call saying that, you know, these monarchs are eating me out of house and home. And 
not every monarch is going to make it to um, butterfly stage and that's okay. You know, if your milkweed dies or if it gets, if you get a cold snap, you know, that's just a circle of life. Yep. Uh, we may record, we just had a question about recording the next webinar. So we, mm -hmm. we might do that. We typically don't record these and, uh, you know, the, when we post them, we have to have closed captioning and it's, uh, it can take, uh, quite a bit of time to get those worked through, but, uh, and we, we really enjoy you all in the interaction we get here. Uh, and we miss that if we just post it and, you know, you guys watch it on your own, but, uh, we will, um, if we get enough requests, uh, we will record them, uh, or record the next one here, and and so you can watch it later. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, any other questions from the group? Uh, open up to landscape questions, and again, Julie and I and Rachel, we're here in Leon County, and so, well, Rachel and I are in Leon County, Tallahassee, Julie's over in Panama City, so uh, if you're trying to grow some tropical uh, plant, we may not be the best, but Julie mentioned <laughs> how to contact your local extension agent. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that map. And I think most of you probably know where your local office is, but I am going to find that link where you can find your local office. I got a question. So we have a lot of weeds and I know right now we're coming up on like the, the pre-emergent time, right? So this mm -hmm. would be for the emergence for winter weeds coming up soon, right? Yes, as we start getting cooler nights, um, and you know, we kind of thought we were there, but now it's hot again. But uh, should be really, when we start getting into those, what, 55, 60 degrees at night for four or five days in a row, we want to put out the pre-emergent for the winter annual weeds. And don't do a combination of fertilizer with it. Just do straight pre-emergent if you're going to use it. Um, this is not the time of year to be pushing foliage and stem growth on plants, knowing that we could be within six, you know, we're, we're within four to six weeks of a potential frost date. May not happen, but it has happened early November. I know over here in Panama City, probably the same for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our, our average last frost day is about November 15th. Yeah, yeah, I think that's our average, but I know I've, I've, I've seen it in the first couple of days of November. And, and of course, it was not just one of those mild ones. It was the 20 degrees and, ugh. <laughs> All right. Julie, I just, I just thought of a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. What and as becomes from Rachel's, you know, talking about weeds. So, are there, you know, are are there some insects, either pests or beneficials, or maybe I get yeah, both that might harbor in the weeds that we would leave around sure. a vegetable garden? And so, we should should we get rid of all those weeds? What about the good bugs that they might bring? <laughs> well, I mean, in my vegetable garden, I usually do try to eliminate all the weeds. Just just makes it easier. Um, you know, if there's some, yeah, I don't like weeds in my vegetable garden. <laughs> uh, you know, and they, even around, it just depends on what it is. Yeah. One, one big depends, one. It depends, Mark. It depends. <laughs> oh, yeah, our favorite answer. Yeah. Uh, one big weed that we have is Biden's Alba around our vegetable garden. And it's like a double edged sword because it spreads really easily. It's a native plant, but it also provides a lot of uh, pollinator, like it provides a lot of nectar and pollen to pollinators. So it's kind of depends. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the community garden where I have um, some beds, there's a lot of Biden around and I, I wouldn't even attempt to try to control it, but I, I just try to eliminate the weeds that are specifically in my bed. And now sometimes that may be some that are around the outside edge because we do have raised beds but we also have torpedo grass and it will mm. through the slats of the wood and the metal siding and crawl into the beds. I am and so I, sorry. I, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm not leaving it. It's kind of <laughs> worse than Bermuda grass, I mean, pretty much. Oh uh, yeah, way yeah. worse than Bermuda grass. It's, it's my number one enemy weed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any other questions from the group? We got 10 more minutes. 
Uh, let's see. Is anyone who is everyone's planning? Well, uh, again, we're in North Florida, so uh, this is time. Maybe your your vegetable gardens getting put in. Uh, they don't have any questions about vegetables. They might want to get started here soon. You you Central South Florida folks, you're on a whole other schedule. Uh, you have to contact that local office. Yeah. Hi. I'm just prepping my garden plot to put in my fall crop. Awesome. Good job. Yeah, I think we're going to be doing probably radishes and some, I want to find some, um, we grew some baby bok choy last year. It was so good. Um, but sometimes that's hard to find. Hmm. Yeah, I know I have uh, I have some seeds going. We'll see, you know, hopefully um, hopefully I have time to plant them all. And ever since I started working for Extension Julie, my vegetable garden's been terrible. <laughs> you don't uh, have time to, you don't have time to garden, I know. Yeah. Um we got a question. When's the oh well here's one. The last date to plant seeds in Leon. What's our favorite answer, Julie? It depends. It depends on what seeds. you're planting. So uh, <laughs> our, our ag agent, Molly Jamison, she would tell you that if you're trying to do things like the broccolis and the cabbages, um, let's see, what else? Uh, she would, you know, she would tell you by now you want to do transplants. Um, some of the fast growing things like uh, lettuces, arugula that you can kind of pick to eat, even your carrots, you could still kind of, you could actually start now and succession plant pretty much right on through until February, um, March even. So it depends on what you're trying to grow. Um, so I guess uh, there's a great document or there's a great resource, the Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. I will pull that up real quick. Um, and it's got a lot of, you know, it's got all the dates um, in that that you need to and it's broken up by broken up by region so you can um you know for the for those folks in central and south florida so you know i uh, i mentioned i grew up in palm beach county my mother my family a lot of my family still live there uh, and she's always telling me what she's starting and it's so like weird to me because they're they're so different from us um uh, there was a question came in on uh, a class on seed saving. We'll we'll look into that. Yeah, I bet you, um, I bet you, Trevor Rachel might be a good one because I know he's done. I think he's chatted with our master gardener groups about the various different types of fruit and how you go about. You know, if it's a a, a um, kind of like a, a wet, juicy, fleshy fruit versus a dry fruit, how you would go about uh, saving the seeds in the different. Um, for the different species. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one on here on uh, passion vine hasn't bloomed once. So they've had a passion vine for about a year and it hasn't bloomed once. So the first things I think of are what's the light conditions, um, watering, you know, or, you know, making sure it's like doing well, uh, it's in the right place for the plant. Uh, and then are there caterpillars on it? So yeah, if there's, go ahead. If the the if the passion vine is a larval host plant for two kinds of caterpillars, um, it's the zebra longwing and the Gulf fritillary. So they're really they look kind of similar, but they're different colors. They're um, between like an inch to two inches long, and they're either orange or black or orange or white with black spines, um, and they are voracious. They will eat your your um, passion vine down to a nub. So that could also be, uh, they've even eaten through like my flowers. <laughs> they just carved a circle through the flower. So wow. it's, it's definitely an arms race between the caterpillar and the plant. Uh, she actually just wrote back or he or she just wrote back that it's part shade. Uh, mm. It grows like crazy, but never puts on a bloom. So uh, fertilization would be the next one. So there are mm -hmm. instances where too much fertilization will actually encourage vegetative growth and not flowering. So beans actually, for you vegetable gardeners, beans are a really good example of if you're jacking up the soil a little bit too much with nitrogen, the beans are like, well, let's just keep growing and not, you know, fruit. Everything's doing, going great. Let's just keep growing. So, um, 
That is a little bit weird. You know, sometimes plants, it's, it could be nutrient related. Um, you mentioned it's in part shade. Uh, a lot of cues for flowering come from that day length. Um, uh, but, you know, usually they pick up on, you know, that, that's something they just pick up on. So that is a little, a little strange. Um, probably is too much. She's uh, Those are probably the most likely causes. The, the yeah, but she did say she's been using some time. Yeah, she's been using some fertilizer. So yeah, try to try to um, oftentimes plants will get basically stressed into reproducing, right? Because they want to make sure that mm -hmm. they're going to pass on those seeds to the next generation or, you know, survive until the next generation. So they will, you know, stress can be something that will force them to bloom uh, sometimes. What kind of passion vine was it again? What variety? Uh, it's an edulous. So I think okay. that's one of the, one of the more ornamentals. Let's see. Passiflora edulis. I'm gonna look that one up. I don't know that one. It has the really large fruits that people like to eat in South Florida. Yeah, I think it's a South Florida one. Let me see in the Florida page here. I always get these all turned around. We have Incarnata is the one I, th right? Incarnata is the one I'm used yeah, to. Yeah, that's what we do up here, really common. Tuberosa, which is the quirky stem. I know that one from down south. Uh, yeah, edulis is the more cultivated passion fruit uh, down in South Florida. Um, so yeah, check out your, you know, uh, try to reduce that fertilizer use and see if that kind of forces it into, um, you know, trying to reproduce. So, you, you know, then it'll go into flower. Hello, I have a comment on that. All right, what you got? I have two passion vines. One's in full sun, one's in partial shade. The one in partial shade wasn't doing too great for three years, never flowered, so I cut it back. And now it's giving out flowers. The one in full sun is just going crazy. It's all over my coconut tree. <laughs> and the butterflies, the Gulf Fritillary mm -hmm. is loving it. Awesome. And it's flowering too, but maybe cutting back the vine might help. Yeah, and that might be another like a stressful, stressful. thing, you know, mm -hmm. to put it through that stress to get it to say, oh my gosh, I got to make babies. And then you know, <laughs> it'll flower and fruit. Um, well, folks, we're at 1158. Um, uh, we thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope the person from Denmark uh, learned a little <laughs> something useful that he can apply or he or she can apply in Denmark. We thank you for joining us, and we thank everyone for joining us all over the state of Florida. Appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I uh, hope you all have a great week, rest of your week, and we'll be back in two weeks talking plant propagation. So uh, bring your questions, and I'll try to answer them best we can. Right, Rachel? Mm -hmm. All right. And thanks again to Julie for coming and Hi. joining us today from Panama City. Appreciate it. It was fun. Uh, and great. see, uh, you know, hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.